Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome along to the SPSP Essentials of Safe Care webinar. Our focus today being, is your team ready for safety? We can move to the next slide, please. Delighted to have so many people join us from right across health and social care this afternoon, and I hope you're, you're in for a really interesting um, session today. My name is Jo Matthews. I'm the Associate Director of Improvement and Safety within Healthcare Improvement Scotland. And within that, I also lead the Scottish Patient Safety Programme. Move to the next slide. So I'm sure most of us on this call by now are very familiar with Teams and webinar etiquette. But just to be on the safe side, we just want to take you through a, a number of um, key points to ensure everybody is able to participate within the session. This session is being recorded um, and the information from it and the recording will be shared on the SPSP part of the learning system, which is within our website at www.ihub.scot. Um, during this meeting, you will see that your camera and your sound has been disabled. We do actively encourage um, communication through the chat box. So if you want to reflect a point or raise a question for any of the speakers, and we actively encourage you to do that throughout this afternoon's session, and there will be opportunity for us to pick those questions up, please pop your information into the chat box and we will have um, some of the team keeping an eye on that just to make sure that we can pose those questions to our speakers. Move to the next slide, please. If you have any technical difficulties at all, here is the website to get a, um, a hold of one of the team and they will be able to support you. I appreciate that teams can often be a little bit tricky, um, so don't hesitate to get hesitate to get in contact if you do have any problems. Slide, please. So, on to the session itself. I'm really delighted to have um, a number of speakers with us today from right across health and social care, but also thinking about that focus, which is very much today's session on leadership and staff wellbeing and how that can grow effective teams across our care settings. We're going to learn from those teams about how they're using the SPSP Essentials of Safe Care to help support their improvements in safety. And as always, within these learning um, webinars, this is an opportunity for us all to come together, to be able to share our experiences, learn from each other, in order that we can um, take that learning back and accelerate improvement within your own care setting. If we can move to the next slide, please. So we've got a really busy agenda today. I'm delighted to see that we have a, a number of speakers, both from the Care Inspectorate, from NHS Orkney, um, and Dr Andy Cope, um, who many of you will know from um, the Art of Being Brilliant work. He is prolific on Twitter, has a number of books as well, and we'll come on to his um, bio shortly. And after each of these, there are opportunities for questions. So as you're hearing our speakers, Please don't hesitate to jot down those questions into the chat box. Move to the next slide, please. So I appreciate that there are always new people joining the sessions for the first time. And certainly uh, um, as we have relaunched SPSP over the last couple of years, um, we've been interacting with a, a range of new people who have never really had exposure to the work previously. So I always think it's a good opportunity to just um, remind us of what SPSP is. So it is a national quality improvement programme that aims to improve the safety and reliability of care and reduce harm. In existence for roughly about 15 years now, it has until recently supported improvements across acute primary care, inpatient mental health, maternity, neonatal, paediatric services and medicines. Um, with over the last couple of years, those connections into the social care space starting to grow. At its heart, it's about supporting people to apply quality improvement methods to key safety issues, capturing progress and learning through iterative cycles of testing, 
and then sharing that knowledge in order that others can improve. And that's very much what we're here to do today. And through this approach, SPSP has been supporting teams, organisations and systems to create the conditions in which safe care can be delivered. There are three core elements to the programme. The essentials of safe care, which I'm going to touch on shortly, and you're going to hear throughout our session this afternoon. The SPSP improvement programmes themselves and our SPSP learning system, of which you will be able to access through the IHOP website. Next slide, please. So what are the essentials of safe care? Well, it's an, it aims to provide evidence-based guidance for the safe delivery of care in all settings. It brings together existing guidance and standards into one package to make it easy for people to access and get to the information they need. It is supported by an interactive driver diagram, a change package and a measurement framework, which can be applied in any health or care setting. And this is the current version of the driver diagram, which we try to describe as a bit of a route map to enabling the safe delivery of care for an, every system, for every person, every time. It was developed by health, social care, the third and independent sector and housing colleagues a couple of years ago. Um, and the website includes a, a library of resources to support implementation, including quick read guides, underpinning evidence bases and examples of good practice. There's also a measurement framework for local use, and that's split into two sections. The first is about a readiness assessment that helps organisations and teams understand how ready they are for change, coupled with tools to understand how to embed the essentials within your service. But also within that, there's a prioritisation tool to identify where to identify where improvement work can be focused. Alongside that, there is a measurement framework to track the actual improvement over time using existing data, not asking for anything in addition, because we don't want to add to that um, data burden that so many people can reflect on. The essentials have been developed in such a way that they would be sufficiently generic enough that they can be adapted to reflect all health and social care contexts. And they are now embedded within each of the change packages that support the improvement activity within each of the different SPSP programmes. And that really takes us nicely into introducing our first speaker. So I'm delighted to introduce Nicola McArdle. Um, Nicola is joining us from the Care Inspector today. Nicola is a physiotherapist and a Scottish Quality and Safety Fellow. She's worked in a variety of settings, but all the roles have allowed her to focus on her passion of supporting and enabling healthy ageing. Nicola's current role is Senior Improvement Advisor within the Care Inspectorate Health and Social Care Improvement Team, where her work focuses on safer mobility, frailty, rehabilitation and reablement. So I'm delighted to hand over now to Nicola, who's going to take us through the work that she has been doing on creating the conditions for innovative, innovative improvement. Thank you very much. Over to you, Nicola. Thank you. I should have taken control of the slides. Hi, thank you for having me here this afternoon. So that was a lovely introduction and actually lets me just get straight into my project chat here. So pleased to meet you. Oh, sorry, I don't seem to have control. I'm going to see if I can make it work now. Yes, apologies for that. That's me now. So pleased to meet you. I promise I don't try and shoehorn that I'm a Scottish Quality and Safety Fellow into every conversation. It is relevant to this and it's because as part of that fellowship, I had to undertake a project. I was lucky enough to have a project that was trialling the use of an app called PainCheck. So PainCheck uses artificial intelligence technology to assess pain in people who are unable to verbalise it. So for this project, it was care home residents with dementia. 
You can see how this innovative way to assess pain aligns with the overarching aim of the Essentials of Safe Care, which is to enable the delivery of safe care for every person within every system, every time. And it was really important for me to ensure that the focus of the project was improving outcomes for people receiving care. So as well as looking at the number of pain assessments and medication changes, we also considered a number of quality of life measures. I want to introduce you or bring your focus to the Cotter's eight step change model. John Cotter was a professor at Harvard and in his book Leading Change, he introduced us to this model. Step one of the change model is creating a sense of urgency. The research findings around pain assessment in people with dementia show that there is an obvious need for change. In care homes, up to 80% of people with dementia will regularly experience pain. And as that dementia progresses, the prevalence and intensity of that pain will increase as a person's ability to tell you their sore is taken away. And because of this, pain is often under-recognised and under-treated for this population. So there's an obvious need that is an urgency for change. Step two is forming a powerful guiding coalition. I'm really lucky to work with a small project group within the care inspectorate, but for the purpose of this webinar, when I talk about teams, I mean the care home staff who are the people actually on the ground and using the app. Step three is developing a vision and strategy. It's an inherent human trait to want to help someone in pain. All the care home staff who signed up to the project shared in the vision that we want pain assessment and pain management to be optimised. So steps one to three are the steps that create a climate for change, but it then became our job to make that change happen. This is the diffusion of innovation. It's a theory that seeks to explain how, why, and at what rate new ideas and technologies spread and was popularised way back in 1962. So at the beginning of this curve, it shows you'll have your innovators, the people who want to be the first to try something, followed by your early adopters, people who are intrigued by how new ideas and products can be helpful. Then you have your early majority, people who like new ideas, but want to know for sure that something's going to be useful. And they're followed then by your late majority, people who sometimes are a bit more afraid of risk and doubtful of their own ability to use new ideas. They like finished, proven ideas and to know that something will work before they start. And then you have your laggards at the end. These people are resilient and resistant to change and often don't want to change unless it's enforced. But what I like about this is that it shows not everyone will adopt a new idea at the same rate. So, for example, I have a friend, Michael, who as soon as a new Apple product comes onto the market, he has it the first day. I, on the other hand, although I do have an iPhone, I won't change it until it becomes so slow that I've got no choice. So in this case, Michael's an innovator and I'm somewhere at the end of the late majority. But in other instances, I'm definitely more up the further end of the curve, an innovator. So I'm really passionate in finding new ways of thinking around safer mobility and falls and maybe more risk averse than others in this instance. But the important thing about this theory for me is that all people involved are important. You need to harness that enthusiasm of your early adopters, but the insights you can gain from your late majority and laggards are really important. Scaling your project can often highlight valid concerns that because of your enthusiasm, you might otherwise miss. I like this slide too. that they want to be the ones making that change. Step five of Cotter's change model is to enable a team to take action to incorporate your change. So for our project, that was to introduce the use of the Pain Check app. This involved listening to all staff involved and addressing concerns and where possible removing obstacles that identified that could hinder the project. For me, as an innovator and somebody hugely passionate about the potential of this project, it was important to recognise my enthusiasm can blind me to potential areas of concern. So these are some of the things that we found. A reluctance to recognise that pain management could be an issue. What I heard from a few people was, we know our residents really well. I think we'd know if they were in pain. It can be hard when you take a pride in your work to consider that you might not always be getting it right. And this project made me reflect on my clinical time. And I can see that there must have been patients who have seen and assessed who could have been in pain, because they presented atypically 
and nobody voiced specific concerns about pain, that I haven't given it great enough consideration. And by being able to be vulnerable and open and share this with the staff, it was really powerful because they then realised there's no judgement in their practice. We're all working together. Time and staffing. This won't be a surprise to anyone. It's a huge issue across all areas of health and social care just now. But we were really lucky that even under current pressures, care services were willing to volunteer. And it was because they all have the shared vision of optimising care. A lack of confidence and a reluctance to adopt new technology. This is one I can definitely empathise with. I refused to get a Kindle for years after they came out because I liked the feel of a book and I was scared that it would lead to the closure of libraries. But actually now I don't know how I ever did without it. For the project, we were able to demonstrate that the app's a recognised medical device to provide reassurance and build in plenty of opportunities for staff to play and practice with the app in early training sessions to give them the confidence in its use. Another thing that I hadn't expected or appreciated before the chat was that some staff were protective of the role. So within some services, only nurses had previously carried out pain assessments and the idea of involving a wider care team caused some discomfort. But it was reinforced that clinical decision making is as important as it always has been, with the app just giving further information to inform that decision. We also realised that we would need to involve people out with just that small care home team and include GPs and ANPs in any decision making and giving them an awareness and an understanding of the project could streamline where they are required to come in for medication reviews. And then lastly, QI fatigue. And this was reinforced, I was pleased to see yesterday, Helen Bevan posted something on Twitter about making sure that you build in time between change ideas for your team before you tire them out. So QI fatigue, I understand. Heraclitus, a Greek philosopher said, change is the only constant, but it can be exhausting. And acknowledging this and making sure everyone knows how their efforts are working towards a shared vision can go a long way to keep engagement. Here, now to the nice bit, celebrating success. It's hugely important. So going back to Cotter's change model for the last time, steps six to eight, are to formulate short-term goals, build on the change to sustain the improvement and to anchor these changes so that they become normal practice. So short-term goals for our project could have been one person who wasn't very confident using the app agreeing to give it a go, or the team aiming for all residents to have at least one pain assessment a week. But by recognising and celebrating these short-term wins, we can really motivate teams when long-term goal, long goals seem far off. We do need to be careful though. Cotter argued that many projects fail because victory is declared too early. Quick wins are only the beginning of what needs to be done. Momentum for the project has to be sustained. Sharing ongoing bigger wins like the ones displayed in the screen can show teams the difference they're making to those they care for. If you were shown these figures and could see the impact you'd had, you can see why you'd be happy to continue your efforts. So these are the findings from the first care home involved. And when we presented these to the care home team, they were absolutely delighted. I looked forward to going back to the home. So, for example, falls, a passion of mine. You can see there was an initial reduction of 75% with an overall reduction of 42%. I can't wait to go back and speak to the residents in the, who were participating in the project to say, so what did that mean? Are they now more likely to be able to go out a walk with their families when they visit? Or are they getting up to dance when Strictly comes on on a Saturday? What does that actually mean to people? And I'm going to finish off now just with two quotes. The first one's often used in relation to individual people, but I think it's as applicable when we're speaking about teams. When change is done to people, they experience it as violence. But when change is done by people, they experience it as a liberation. So what I take from that is involve your whole team, value your whole team, even the ones who don't seem too keen, and involve them at as early a stage as you can. And then lastly, I'm a definite people person, so this one rings true for me. If you take out the team and teamwork, it's just work. Who wants that? Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicola. A fantastic example of, of following that um, quality improvement journey right along um, from creating the will, creating the conditions, bringing your team with you, the tests, the data, the feedback, 
um, and, but also the continued learning through that to be able to get to a place of both celebrating success and building that sustainability. Through all of that, you you have continued to create those con conditions, and and I'm sure the outcomes, as you've demonstrated within those those results from those early tests, will be having a significant impact on the the quality and safety of care and experience for those residents as well. So it's a, a huge amount of of learning there. We're going to pause for a second and move on to Shauna, and then we will come back to questions at the the end of in this session. So uh, thank you to Nicola and I'm delighted now to introduce Shauna who works for NHS Orkney. Shauna is a physiotherapist and team lead for the Ageing Well Service with over 15 years experience in community falls and frailty prevention. She took on the clinical lead role for the falls component of the SPSP Collaborative in August of last year. And you're going to hear from Shauna about um, the readiness assess assessment that has been required to support her um, in the delivery of the falls improvement work. So lovely to have you, Shauna. Over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Joe. Um, I think perfect. Thank you. So as Joe said, I'm a community based physio with a background in falls and frailty prevention, which seems to be a common theme here today. Um, and I have actually been um, providing support and clinical lead for the Scottish Patient Safety Programme um, for the board since um, for the last 12 months nearly. And I, I am absolutely passionate about improvement for both patients and for staff. But unlike Nicola, I come into this with limited quality improvement no knowledge. Um, I'm delighted to say I am now halfway through my skill project. So the learning from that has been a game changer and delighted to have been on on the programme. Next slide, please. So a little bit of local context. Um, we're way up north of the north of Scotland. We're the smallest, smallest health board in Scotland. Um, in the acute setting, we have two inpatient wards. IP1 covers everything from medical, surgical and all ages. IP2 is an assessment and rehab ward and until recently um, also had our oncology and palliative care unit in two. It is all single rooms. We moved into the new Balfour in 2019. So um, the single rooms and the car floor plate has added additional challenges. We have limited specialists, but lots of fabulous generalists. We do um, have a high use of locum and agency staff. And as a result, over the last few years, that's resulted in quite an unstable system with um, quite a high change in leadership roles. But we did, we signed up for the SPSP programme for the first time in July last year. Um, and next slide, please. We um, completed the readiness for change tool and with my lack of understanding or knowledge in, in the programme, um, it became very apparent that um, we, we were not particularly ready. Um, next slide, please. IP2 was slightly more ready, but um, next slide, please. We, we still needed to start somewhere, so we we had some baseline data. I got a bit of understanding about what who were in patients were, and not surprisingly, um, the majority of our patients are um, frail elderly. Next slide, please. Uh, we got some background on the number of balls and that we get good reporting. We get a lot of um, data access put in, but we discovered fairly quickly that they were there wasn't an awful lot of learning happening as a result of them. Next slide, please. But with the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, um, I was delighted to see um, so much of the work had been done for us. We had lots of fabulous change ideas, lots of demonstrations of all improvements already tried and tested. Um, an opportunity we had an aim ready written. I did decide to go for a slightly lower aim in the reduction of falls, but really had. So the first three um, primary drivers there had, had good confidence that we could do something but I had very little insight into the how how we could create um, organisational safety culture and was aware that um, staff on the ward 
their well-being and post-COVID everybody was fatigued and um, another ask would be quite a challenge. Next change slide please. I did however um, knowing that there was absolutely a sense of urgency um, I had one day a week for six months to deliver this fabulous programme. Um, so I was very much coming in gung ho, lots of tools that we could help deliver and support the staff to, to improve quality and um, safety on the wards. Um, next slide. So complete opposite to Nicola, I skipped along to um, let's start chain testing change um, with very little insight of the the points before um, and needless to say um, it, it was challenging and discovered very quickly speaking to the staff on the wards understanding where they were at that I needed to go back and the webinar series from the SPSP team certainly helped support that. Next slide please. Because uh, there was understanding that other areas were also finding the delivering the changes were much more challenging than had in initially had been anticipated. Um, so went back and started to understand the stories, but it wasn't just the data we were sort, sorting, it was the patient stories, but also listening to the staff and hearing how they were feeling about the, the falls on the wards and what they felt could be done to help improve. Because we were coming into a place that had no previous experience of the safety programme or no understanding of what I would be asking them to do. Next slide, please. So we continue to understand the system and um, lots of conversations and I'm not going to go through the slide in particular detail, but it was quite overwhelming to see how much needed to be done and how far off we were. Um, so I, I did, I thought we need to start somewhere and the best place is to, with the staff. I wanted to know what, what they were interested in, so decided on next slide please asking and um, providing a survey to see if we could get some engagement to see where the staff thought they felt they were least confident and in the aspects of patient safety and if they would be interested or not in receiving any training. Next slide. And we did, we got great feedback and um, my colleague was fabulous at putting the um, the questionnaire around and we got good feedback but again there was no clear priorities coming out of the of the survey tool except if you move on to the next slide please there was absolutely a, a clear um agreement that everybody wanted training except one and that was that was our end um we were listening they they wanted training on various aspects and um, it just gave us an opportunity to develop an all teach all learn environment um, and the tea trolley training idea was um, developed. No, it wasn't my idea, it was again, it was an idea of a member of staff who had had this um, in a previous place and said that was a fabulous way of engaging with people and given an opportunity um, to improve MDT working, to share ideas and to build motivation um, for improvement. During that time, in the process of having done the questionnaire, um, we had a site visit by the Scottish Patient Safety Programme team, and that also helped us build our team further um, because it, it helped our board engage and it enabled um, more staff to go away on in April to the learning event, which has been invaluable. Next slide. So we are, we are finally making progress and um, we're talking to the staff. I have managed to deliver a session of training on not surprisingly deconditioning and positive risk taking. So we now have 12 more people who understand what, what we're talking about and what our plans are. They had an opportunity to share their ideas and this is a photo of the day room that has previously been used as a, a staff room um, for, for lunches and um, we're going to change it into a day room like it was planned to be and they've got lots of suggestions as to what we can can do in it. We also encourage them to have to, to discuss fears and how we might overcome them. We've got changes planned and there's definitely enthusiasm for more and different themes of training and the cake was a game changer. It got everybody in the room. Next slide please. So what I would say and it's very much echoing what Nicola said, listen, 
listen to what the, the staff are saying, but also demonstrate that they've been heard and be brave. That, that's more a point to me um, because I'm very much out of my comfort zone doing this, but um, taking the small steps. And I'm echoing um, Lara Mitchell's um, quote from the learning event that start small. It was music to our years, but start somewhere. And we certainly have. So um, that's Thank you. Thank you very much, Shauna. A, a fantastic example of um, recognition of that moment to pause before embarking on, on a change and, and really understanding how ready is your team for that change when it's um, so easy to immediately jump into um, implementation when we know that if the conditions are not in place, then those changes are going to be much harder to make, most certainly will not be sustained and can actually um, damage um, a lot of the, the issues in terms of being able to um, engage teams in any further change. So um, thank you so much for that and, and your reflections there. Um, we have a, a few comments in the, the chat box and I know that Claire has been keeping an eye on this for us. Um, I wonder if you wanted to come in, Claire, just to pick up on any points and questions. Yeah, and thanks to Nicola and Shauna. They were both great presentations. And um, we've got a couple of questions initially for yourself, Nicola, in the chat box. Um, it's from Una McFadgen. Do you think there are opportunities to extend your work to young people with communication and other disabilities? So luckily, we've just been granted funding. Or not luckily, we've worked very hard for it but for phase two of the project, and that's exactly what we're looking for now. Younger adults, we're looking for people perhaps with addiction issues or different conditions to see about spreading sustainability and actually if it works as well in other, ser other services. Thanks, Nicola. And another question for you, would the pain app be able to be used in acute NHS hospitals and would that come at a high financial cost? I do, I'm, I'm not a face, like the spokesperson, it is, a, they are a personal company, so I'm not here branding them, there are, there are other things available, um, but I think that in any clinical setting where somebody struggles to express pain, it would absolutely be valid. I'm sure, Nicola, you'd be happy to share some details around, of course. around the app. Yeah. What I will um, say, though, is like Shauna, Kate will get me in the room, if anybody <laughs> does have any asks, I love that. Uh, and I've got a quick question myself for you, Shauna. Um, I just wondered, I, I think I've spoken to you before about using the readiness tool from the Essentials for Safe Care. And I wondered if you could just say a wee bit about how that helped you in your process. Well, I think it just highlighted that we were a ways off and how important it was to engage with the staff and um, spend time with them. But it was finding a way in was really difficult. Um, so it was going along to without asking more. So making sure that we did it in a, a, a very careful way and engaging with them when it was suitable. So it means that already existed without asking additional things with them and listening, listening to their ideas because they're the ones that deliver the care day in, day out. And they had some great ideas. So making sure we, we demonstrated, we heard what they were saying. Thank you both. Slow and steady and bring cake. That's the messages that I'm taking away. Thanks very much. And I think at the heart of what you're describing there has, has very much been about the, the what matters to, to you, both from um, the person delivering the care, the person receiving the care. And really, when you get to the centre of that, about that well-being elements of that. And that takes us nicely on to our next presenter. Um, Dr Andy Cope, who I am delighted has been able to join us. He's hot-footed from a, another event, so we were keeping fingers crossed he was, he was going to be able to make it. So fantastic to have you join us this afternoon. Um, I'm sure many of you will have already seen Andy on Twitter or um, have been in, uh, reading any of his books. He also has a, a children's series. Um, but Andy specialises in positive psychology and the science of human flourishing. He calls himself the doctor of happiness and believes that there's never been a more important time to focus on mental health and well-being. And his mission from um, his bio is to change that narrative and refocus psychology away from what's wrong with people to what's right. 
um, and give that real gentle nudge towards people taking charge of their, their own mental health. And much of what you're going to hear in today's session, and I can't wait for you to hear it, um, is really about not just about what we can do within work and how we can be the best um, within our workplace, but this is also will impact our, on overall our, our lives too. So delighted to introduce Andy and I'll hand over to, to you. Right, fantastic. Thank you very much. Can you give me the power to share my screen and I'll get some PowerPoints up in a minute. But while we're doing that, I'm super excited, delighted, I think honoured more than anything to get the nod to talk to you today. So I'm Andy and I'm from, I am from south of the border, but if you forgive me for that, um, I'm going to start with a big thank you. All right, so massive thank you from me, not just to the presenters, but all the participants on this webinar who've given up an hour and a half of your time to come and develop yourselves. All right, so what I want to do is make it totally worth your while. I've got about 45 minutes to, to and I'm not going to talk at you. There'll be some interaction in the chat and we'll see where we go with it. And I have got a happy T-shirt to give away. All right, I have not brought it with me, but I promise you I've got a beautiful, the more you interact with me, <clears throat> Right, the, the better your chance of winning a T-shirt. So if I can share my PowerPoint, let me have a look. Then it might seem a bit random what I'm going to do, but it, there is, it is carefully crafted. So I've called it the art of being brilliant. And I'm actually a doctor, but non-clinical doctor, doctor of psychology. Um, as was just said that I cringed at was I'm actually a doctor of happiness. So basically at Loughborough University down here in England, I spent about 12 years researching positive psychology, which is essentially my job was to seek out happy people <laughs> and follow them around and work out why they're so happy. And I just think that in terms of mental health crisis and in terms of the NHS, where there's so many people now running on empty uh, and burnout is very close all right, to a lot of people, then what I want to do is just give you some stuff that works at work and works at home. Kind of obvious things, but a bit of science of well-being, but like you've never heard it before. So in a different way. So let's crack on. So um, the art being brilliant. Can I start? I'm just going to start with that picture. Um, I, I love that picture. I love it mostly because of that face in the front row and that little human being there. But I do. Uh, I th every time I look at that picture, I, I wonder what's going on in the foreground. So they're all looking at the same thing and they've got com 10 completely different reactions there. And I think the last three years has been a little bit like that picture. So if you think about the worlds we've had in the last three years, we had pre-pandemic, then we had pandemic and now we've got post-pandemic all massive pressures on you um so congratulations on still being in the game but there are some people that are like the lad at the back punching the air so not necessarily on this call today because you're full on and you haven't had any break from it but there are now an element of people who can work from home who've got and maybe they work in marketing and they only have to go into work one day a month <laughs> and the rest of the time they work at their kitchen table and they're punching the air going do you know what i wouldn't brag about it but the pandemic has has, has done me good There'll be a lot of people on this call, that's 100, 100 and more people on this call, like the lad with the hand over his ears, right? Maybe there's less flexibility to do your job from home and you might be frontline on it all the time. And actually, you got through the pandemic, but now you're wondering how and the exhaustion is hitting you. It's like, do you know what? I'm sick and tired of feeling sick and tired. In fact, I want one of those hybrid jobs where I can work from my kitchen table. Or you might have a face on your like in the front row going, Andy, do you know what? I don't even know what day of the week it is. So I just think that in terms of opening this i need to acknowledge that what you do is amazing um, i'm doffing my cap and round of applause for you to still be in on your feet and while i can't cure the external world and the external world will always be exhausting what we can do this isn't really about that so i know that a lot of people are struggling at the moment but this is about your internal world all right and what we can do to fight back against a world that seems hell-bent on knocking the positivity out of us so that's where i want to go but i i don't know which of those faces you've got on I don't know um, how the last three years has treated you, but I am aware that it's exhausting and it's relentless. So that said, um, I was trying to pick a metaphor that would uh, sort of sum up working in the NHS. And I think now I don't know how many years of loyal service you've been in the NHS, but essentially that path seems to be getting narrower. So it's like, ugh, I'm not having to go at the NHS. I think it's wonderful, but it's typically it's like, I'm sorry about this, but can you work a bit harder than you were last year? And not only can you do your day job, but we've got two years of backlog to catch up on. And there's not enough money to run your department. <laughs> and there's some new patients with extra special clinical needs. And, and you know, here's a pay rise below inflation for the fifth year on the bounds. And when can you retire when you're 75? So look, folks, without me overdoing this, is there's a lot of people having a wobble. Right? What I want to do is give you some stuff that allows you to navigate the world as it is, 
not the world as we want it to be, because <laughs> if we're waiting for the perfect world, we're probably going to die waiting. So it's like, how can we continue to thrive in a world that is sometimes not conducive to that. So to get us started and to get some interaction going, folks, can you go in the chat room right now, like literally in the next 30 seconds? And can you put in there three words that describe you at your best? So I need you to do it now because I want to loop back to it later. All right. So don't overthink it because we've only got 30 seconds to get in there because I literally I've got so much content and only about 45 minutes to deliver it. So it's going to be fast. So pop into the chat for me right now. Three words that describe you at your best. All right. Let me just pop in the chat. See what's. Oh, my gosh. Look at you. Like you're already in there. Happy, loving, carefree. Jill, I like it. Fun, energetic, Mis mischievous. Katie, kind, happy, fun. Thanks, Rach. All right. These are all oh, wow, wow, wow. Energetic, enthusiastic and cheery. <laughs> cheery. The beautiful word. Oh, Mary, that's what I can't. Productive, fun and loyal. Oh. Mary, it's beautiful. Right, look, I can't read them all because they're so coming. chilled, focused, motivated. Nice one, Caroline. Um, smiling, happy, smiling, busy, Jill. Uh, bubbly, bubbly, put that. Nicola, bubbly, loving and enthusiastic. All right, <clears throat> fantastic words, folks. Come back to me. Warm, happy, loving. Oh, Fiona, it's beautiful. Um, so come back to me. By the way, I think you're super excited that you're like spread all across Scotland. You might be on the islands. I don't know where you are, but you've all got this patient safety in common. All right. So you all care with a passion, cheery, laid back and supportive. Thanks, Caroline. Right. Come out, come out of the chat. Come back to me. Come back to me. Thanks for doing that. I'm going to come back to those later. But for now, I want to introduce my sort of research piece um, and I'm going to introduce it via Terminator. <laughs> because why wouldn't you want to do that? Right. So just bear with me. I am going somewhere with this, but just bear with me, because what I don't want to do is just like a webinar that you've done a thousand times before. This isn't that right. This might change your life this next 45 minutes. So give me your full attention. If you're on your emails, get off them. <laughs> so Terminator. Most people at some point will have seen Terminator, the movie, the original Arnie movie. It's a bit of a low budget sci fi 1980 thing but it kind of it's pretty cool movie right so in case you've not seen it let me just revise it very quickly so arnie schwarzenegger is a terminator he's a killing machine sent from the future and he's got to kill a lady called sarah connor right and it's classic arnie right so he's what is he nearly seven foot tall built like a brick thingy right he's got his leathers on He's got a backpack with a shotgun in it. He's got his shades on. He's riding a Harley through the streets of Los Angeles and he's looking for this lady. If he sees this woman, she's toast because he's a Terminator. He's a killing machine. And there's also a good guy from the future who's sent to save Sarah Connor. Now, the good guy gets there first and there's a very tense scene in a car where this good guy's got this lady by the scruff of the neck and he's trying to explain why it's so important that she listens to him. And right, I've printed it off for you. This is the exact dialogue from that scene. Right. So remember, this is what the good guy is trying to explain to to this lady, Sarah Connor. And in the background, you can hear the Harley Davidson. So Terminator is catching them. Right. So it's quite tense. So I'm going to quote exactly word for word from that scene. So let's go with it. The good guy says this and I quote, listen and understand that Terminator is out there. It cannot be bargained with. It cannot be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear, and it absolutely will not stop ever. Right. So that's that dialogue. Right. He's talking about the Terminator, which is terrifying. But I think that in the NHS, you can substitute the word change into that dialogue and it still makes perfect sense. So let me go again. But with change. Listen and understand change is out there. It cannot be bargained with. It cannot be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear, and it absolutely will not stop ever. All right now, look, I'm, I'm not suggesting whether change is good or bad is not the point, right? My point is that change is a bit like the Terminator. It isn't going to go away. It has been hunting you down and it will continue to come for you, whether that's new technology, new ways of working, new rounds of budget funding or budget cuts or mergers with other hospitals like we're doing down in England or or new legislation or a pandemic or AI. I don't know what it is, but I guarantee change will be hunting you down. So therefore, if change is coming at us and it isn't going to go away anytime soon, then we've got to be ready for it. So the thing is, how can we be 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 change ready? So 
this and this is where it links in with what was said about about getting your team on board getting your team on board right i think i've got the answer to that so let me go back to i think this is a really important powerpoint what i'm suggesting if you look at the terminated quote and you think about change in the health service when there's a lot of change going on when it's uncertain when there's a lot of ambiguity out there if we can add a dollop of creativity right there are some opportunities right i know they're not always easy to see but i promise you there are some opportunities and the opportunity is not to go back to pre-pandemic. The opportunity is to do it better than it was pre-pandemic. Do it differently. Take the lessons we've learned and supercharge it. So, and so Scotland is the best place to access healthcare on the planet. All right, that's the challenge. So, how do we do that? Where are the opportunities? How do we see them? Now, so here's my here's my research piece. I'm going to do it super quick. Because I know you're not bothered necessarily about the background. Just, just tell us how to be happy, Andy. Just tell us. Let me just tell you about the 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 PhD piece first, because it 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 is a game changer, right? I promise you. So, I studied psychology many years ago, like every other psychologist has, and it's always been the same. So, for 150 years, psychology has been what we call a disease model: phobias, disorders, anxiety, depression, paranoia, trauma, schizophrenia. So, what we do as psychologists is we learn what's wrong with people, and once we've diagnosed them or given them that label, then we can help. So, here's some medication, or here's some counselling. Or if that doesn't work, here's some medication. Uh, here's, here's, here's coaching, counselling, medication, whatever. Yeah, we can help, but we need to diagnose you first. And that's great. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. And I did that as well. Right. That's what psychology has been for 150 years is let's find out what's wrong with you and then let's put you right. But think about it. The thing the thing is, here's the thing. It's a big thought is this. Despite the best efforts of 150 years of psychology, despite the best therapy and the best counselling and the best medication that we can come up with. The truth is, and you see it every single day in your day job, is that mental ill health has been getting steadily worse not steadily better so despite our best efforts of being super busy trying to fix people there are too many people to fix and they've got more issues than ever before so my point is there's something missing it's getting worse not better i'm going into primary schools right and there's kids age eight on anxiety medication which doesn't seem right to me all right so what i got real what i realized was in 2005 I had this light bulb moment that pretty much forever Psychologists have never, ever studied people who are already happy right? on the grounds of them not being ill. Right? If you think about it, everybody on this call, that's 140 people. Right. You can all think of in your life a handful of people, probably a single handful, actually, of people in your life who've got something extra. They're a little bit different. They've got an extra smile on their face. They've got an, they've got an extra positive uh, attitude. They kind of come to work with a with they, they're a bit weird they seem to love mondays like everybody else loves fridays it's not right is it they've got energy they they go the, these are your work colleagues who go the extra mile without you having to ask them 10 times it's kind of built into them they create these strong relationships they they turn up at meetings with an open mind and a willingness to give things a go not only are they great to have in the workplace these these people with this extra something they're even better to have at home particularly as really close as parents and grandparents. So while the rest of psychology continue to look at illness, and I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, I decided to flip psychology on its head and look at wellness. Right, my counterintuitive starting question is, who are the people who aren't ill? <laughs> who are the happy people, right? Because psychology doesn't know that. We've literally ignored them on the grounds of them just having a smile on their face and they don't need medication or therapy. So they just get on with their life. I'm like, well, who the heck are they? Who are the happy people and what are they doing that allows them to flourish? And thirdly, most importantly, that I want to just begin to open up to you today is what might we then learn from them that we could apply to us so we might also have that something extra. All right. And I know it sounds beyond obvious, but it's really not because psychology continues to be a disease model. It continues to be coming through the system is looking at what's wrong with people. And of course, I'm not saying that's wrong. right? I'm not I'm not having to go. I'm just saying. Let's radically rethink it. All right. Because the world's changed. So maybe our, our, our focus needs to change. So basically what I did was, uh, and again, super quick, is about 12 years of my life in this next two minutes. So please try and look interested. <laughs> is uh, if you're doing a PhD, you need some data. So I work with people like yourselves, working age people. And I gave out lots of diaries and I asked people to record how they feel during the working week. 
So imagine if I gave everybody in NHS Scotland, every member of staff, that's tens of thousands of people. This week, I gave everybody a diary. All you've got to do is record how you feel, then hand your diaries back into me a week later. Then I've got loads of data. All right? I've got lots of people and uh, uh, diaries. I was able to code the emotions and begin to put people onto a graph of happiness at work. And if I did that, it would look something like this. All right. So everybody on this call this week during your working hours, we've all got a natural high point and a natural low point emotionally. So that upper level of positive, that's you this week when you love your job. That's you when you've got a bit of a bounce, a bit of a spring, you've got a smile on your face, you feel creative, you feel resilient, you feel 10 foot tall and bulletproof. In fact, if, you bring, if I bring you a problem when you're feeling amazing, it's kind of not a problem. Because that's you. You can take almost anything the world throws at you when you're feeling at your emotional best. And equally, if I went through everybody's diaries and plotted you all on a graph of well-being, everybody, including me, by the way, we've all got the lower level. We've all got that lower level this week where you kind of do love your job, but not right now in this moment. All right, so it, it's a it's an awkward patient or an angry visitor or a negative member of staff or. I don't know, this, you're just so busy, you can't get to the bottom of your emails. You've got more patients and not enough staff or somebody's rung in ill and you've got gaps in your staffing budget or there's nowhere to park or it's a drizzly day. It doesn't have to be a big deal. But when you're at that low ebb, that low level of negative, then it seems like a big deal. If I bring you a problem when you're at that low level, it is a problem because you've not got resilience. You've not got creativity. It's just like, <laughs> is it home time yet? Why do I bother? What's the point? All right. So that's you. It's, I describe it when you get up and goes, got up and gone. <laughs> all right. Now, so what I tried to do then was bring all that data together on one diagram to begin to build up a picture of how the population's feeling. And essentially, and I'm exaggerating to make a point, but the headline news is that far too many people are spending far too much of their time in the bottom third of the diagram. So we've got this workplace culture that is it's not depression, it's not anxiety, that's below the line, that's clinical issues. The blue grey zone is what I call the curse of mediocrity. If we're not careful, we get ground down into low level exhaustion, right? And the health service is really good at doing that to people, right? There's no laughs in that, really. That's really quite serious stuff. Now, again, it, I'm not talking about clinical issues here. I just need to make, but that's the second time I've made that point, right? The blue grey zone, the, I spent 40 years in that bottom third and there was nothing wrong with me, but I was stuck, right? I was stuck in being the average version of me. I would come alive on a Friday, but I wasn't alive on a Monday. Now that's fine if you want to be fine. But I think fine is quite a low bar. So here's your game changer. This is what the rest of the webinar is based on, right? So when I plotted the data, what I found was that not everybody's doing the same. So there's this small percentage of the population that I mentioned earlier, the handful of people you can think of in your life, who when you plot them on the well-being graph, I nickname them the two percenters because there's not many of them, is, as you can see from the diagram, they're living much closer towards the top end of that well-being spectrum. So these people are statistically significantly happier, right? They've got bags more energy as well. So when you're in 2% mode, which basically just means you at your best, that's all it is, is when you're in 2% mode, you've got about 40% more energy. And I don't know about you, but I could do with a bit of that in the modern world. They do stuff, they make things happen, they create strong relationships, they they tend to take a few risks, but they're optimistic, they, they, they bring energy into workplace. And as I said earlier, they're even better to have at home. So while the rest of psychology continues to look at below the bottom line, right, which is fine, I decided to flip psychology on his head and come at it from that top end. Those two percenters answering those three questions that I asked a minute ago. Who the heck are they? What are they doing that allows them to flourish? And thirdly, most importantly, what can we then learn off them that we can put into practice so the upward arrow on my diagram becomes ours for the taking? And folks, look, I don't want to bamboozle you with, with too much stuff today. I just wanted to kind of whet your appetite for it. But honestly, the difference, right, let me come back to full screen to tell you this, because it's so important. I think you know anyway, the difference between you at the bottom of that arrow and the top of that arrow is fundamentally a life changing position. Right. So your next 50 years of your life at work and at home, you in 2% mode, You'll be happier, you'll be healthier, you'll, you'll be more resilient, you'll have stronger relationships. You, there's no downside to you being your best self, which is essentially what I'm talking about. So the question is how?
That was what I was interested in. Is how, how the heck am I supposed to feel amazing when I'm working in the health service? It seems hell bent on knocking the amazingness out of me, right? So I know I do get it. Right? I do get it. So let me just backtrack. I'm a bit excited. I'm just going to calm down. I'm going to ask you about your two percenters in a minute. But can I just say, because I was in a school this morning, so I've been struggling to whether I was going to make this webinar, right? In a primary school, I'm in Cambridge, in a primary school. And every time I do a, pr a primary school visit, I always start with, and they're great, right? Because primary school, <laughs> I've got 250 kids all morning. And they arrange them in, they come in for a big assembly this morning. They arrange them in date order. So you've got these tiny little human beings in the front row that quite frankly look like they shouldn't even be at school. They should be in some sand pit somewhere, not learning apostrophes and capital, capital letters. But anyway, they gradually get older. And then the older ones in primary, they don't sit on the floor. They sit their backsides on the benches at the back because they're 11 years old, right? So I've got 250 kids. And every time in a primary, I always come on in the morning and I say to the kids, right, before we start, so before I talk about anything, I've got a number for you. I've got a special number for you. I always say the average lifespan in this hall is 4,000 weeks, right? And I guarantee, just like this morning, the kids are like, oh my gosh, that is like amazing. 4,000 weeks. That's like forever, isn't it? There's one of the year twos today said, I can't even count to 4,000. It's massive. We're going to live forever. There's 250 kids literally high-fiving each other and punching the air. going, Yeah, that's the best news ever. But then I look around the edge of the hall at the staff, right, the adults in the room, and there was no punching of the air. There was no high fiving. There was a bit. It was the opposite. There was a kind of did he say 4000 weeks was the average lifespan? Is that what he said? That doesn't sound very many. As he made that up. There's a couple of old ones in the corner going, I've used a few. And so have I, right? And that's why being a two percent being that best version of you. That's why fine and not too bad considering is a low bar when you've only got 4,000 weeks to make a dent in the universe. So being your best self, inhabiting that awesome version of you against the odds, all right? I know it's against the odds when, when you're snowed under and when the, the pressures are real. I'm not discounting those, but I'm saying it's not really about that. It's not really about, and it's going to sound harsh. It's not really about what's going on out there. It's about what's going on in here. All right. So I'm going to share some stuff with you. But however, let me go back to my diagram very quickly. So I want to mention the bottom third very quickly. Then I want you to think about your two percenters because I'm going to ask you in a minute who your two percenters are. But I just want to just spend a word on languishing. So in the bottom third of the diagram. So I spent 40 years languishing. There's nothing wrong with me. I wasn't there's was no clinical issues with me, but I was stuck in being myself averagely. All right, lots of rolling your eyes, lots of tutting, lots of looking forward to my holidays, um, but not really much being totally alive. Right? In fact, let me give you an example. Right, I um, so languishing is that sense of something missing. It's that sense of me, and I think if there's something missing in your life, then it's probably you. That's my whole thing, right? It's you at your best. That's the bit that's missing. That was the bit that was missing for me. I, let me give you an example. I used to share a, an office with a lady called Michelle. And Michelle was in the bottom third of that diagram. Right? She's nice. She's nice, but she was quite hard work. So two and a half years, I sat next to Michelle and all she said, her catchphrase, two and a half years, all she said was nightmare. Right? And that was it. I cannot remember any other conversation. Hi, Michelle, how was your weekend? Oh, it was a nightmare. You could actually feel the happiness being ripped from your soul on a Monday morning. I've not even got to my desk yet. But everything's a, like nightmare weather, nightmare traffic, nightmare parking. Nothing wrong with Michelle. She's not depressed. She's not anxious. But really it only takes one person in your team or one person on your ward or one person in your office or one person in your family that is having that nightmare and is on a downer and everybody feels it. Right. So I think my main point on languishing is it's kind of try and make sure it's not us. <laughs> All right. So so what do we get? So I said, and we back to the diagram one more time, just so because. I delivered the same diagram to a bunch of primary school kids today, exactly the same diagram, right? And they got it. So don't overthink it, but I am interested in your two percenters, the ones you've got in your life who you think might be uh, your two percenters. So in the chat, I think let's go in the chat. There's too many people to do it out loud. Pop in the chat for me again. And this time what I'm looking for is who are your two percenters and how do you know? All right. So don't. Don't overcomplicate it. I'm not looking that you're 
I'm not looking to, for you to pick a celebrity off the TV. I'm looking for you to think about somebody you live with or somebody you work with or your next door neighbour or the lady on the checkout at Tesco's. Right. Who have you got in your life that you think straight away? Oh, yeah, they're my two percenters. You won't have many, but you should have a handful in your life. And, and the question there is, who are your two percenters and how do you know? So just pop that in the chat for me. So don't just name them. Tell me why you put them in the chat. Who are your two percenters and how do you know? And, let, and then let's just see if there's any common factors that I think that hopefully there will be. Let's see what comes out. I'm just going to go in the chat, see what's coming through. So who are your two percenters? Um, all oh, right, Nicola, our boss. Right. So, Julie, why did you say why did you choose Nicola? Nicola is your and yeah, yeah, right. So, Suzanne, you've nailed it there. Thank you. Yeah, and Julie, always feel energized energized after time with them. My dog, Selena, you're not taking me seriously. My dog. I think dogs are. <laughs> I think the hashtag be more dog. Is actually a thing. You know what I mean? I think I've got uh, a bit tongue in cheek, but I've got something I call it the love test, Selena. Right. For everybody on this call, if you want to love, if you want to know who loves you more, your partner or your dog, lock them both in the boot of your car for three hours. Then when you open the boot, see which one's most pleased to see you. Yeah. And dog will be like instantly. Oh, my gosh. Partner, less so. All right. OK, brilliant. Um, Sheila, that's really nice. So a manager is always looking for the next steps and your sister's motivated, which is great. Um, oh, good. Uh, uh, Caroline, sounds like you've got a few two percent. One of your daughters. Uh, uh, yeah, brilliant. Husband's an eternal optimist. Thanks, Noreen. All um, oh, right. <laughs> Jenny. Jenny's bidding for the T-shirt with a long answer. I have a friend who's absolutely a 2 percenter. I love spending time with them. Thank you. That's it, isn't it? They have a very unique aura. Make lemonade from, lemonade from the lemons. Right. So that's that really is it, isn't it, um, Jenny? So it, you 2 percenters, it doesn't mean bad stuff doesn't happen to them. They have lemons in their life as well. But they do manage to kind of get through stuff easier right it rains on two percenters two percenters have their train cancelled in a strike as well but they have this ability to stay positive in those situations yeah looking for solutions thanks lynn right we've got some great examples again um oh and oh, can, oh fiona 10 year old granddaughter <gasps> no you'll start me off somebody's gonna start me so, right so carla says susan from the admin office her life just seems great and she pulls me up for being too fast Hey, come on. Right, there's a few nominations for brass band conductor. Andrew says he's pretty <laughs> it's a random call, but I like it. Um, uh, right, you're two adult kids. Thanks, uh, Kay. Yeah. All right. Look, I can't keep up with the answers because they are literally coming in. Mo from our canteen, the dinner lady who's always smiling. <laughs> Oh dear! Right, fantastic. So come back, come back to me, come back to me, come back to me. Oh, they're great. Mo from the canteen. It's, genius, it's a genius answer because it's a bit random, isn't it? So Mo from the canteen probably isn't the highest earner, but you know, the Mo the canteen from the canteen is doing a normal job, but they're doing it from an extraordinary perspective of being their best self. So the reason I wanted you to say not only who your two percenter is, but why did you pick them? If we looked at all the factors, why they're appearing there, the chances are your two percenter, you chose them as a two percenter because when they're around, you feel great as well. All right. They have this uplifting emotional effect. That's what a two percenter is. So the thing about a two percenter and in my research, I call it flourishing. And flourishing is when your happiness is bigger than you. So when you're feeling great, of course, that's good for you. But what happens is when you're in love with life itself, which is what a two percenter is, basically, is that you, that you it's bigger than you. You can't contain that. So when you're genuinely having a great day, then what happens is, of course, that's good for you. But it leaks out of you and it creates these upward spirals of emotion in the people around you. So you have this uplifting, contagious effect that I call flourishing. And that is like a super powerful thing. So if you... If you can't be bothered to be a two percenter for yourself, do it for your family, right? Because they'll feel the uplift as well. Now, this is, there was the second question, but I don't think I'm going to have time to ask it. So I'll, I'll ask it and I'll answer it, all right? But it's quite a powerful question. So the, the second question would be to describe your team in two percent mode. Now, I've not got time to go with that, right? But I do want to just, if I was going to second guess your answer, right? So it's not just you in two percent, but your entire team is in two percent mode. Then I would suggest to you 
that there is an aliveness about that day. There's a vibrancy, there's a can-do mentality. You solution focus, you're buzzing with ideas about how to do things better. You, you, there's not grumble in, in town. It, it's like the customer service is off the scale. But the best thing about your team being in 2% mode is they're the days when work doesn't feel like work, <laughs> right? Now, I know that's some sort of, that sounds like some sort of nirvana, you know, does he not understand the pressures we're under? Yes, I bloody do, which is why we need to create a culture of 2% and because of the pressures we're under, because we deal with them differently when we're all flourishing together. In positive psychology, a team in 2% mode, we call it collective effervescence. And I love that because I know exactly what that means. That means an energy, an aliveness, a glow, a buzz, whatever you want to call it. That's what we're trying to achieve. Now, but it happens in pockets in the NHS. But if, <laughs> if, if, if you've got it kicked off in your team, then it becomes a super powerful thing, right? So the question is how, I think, the question is how, how they're supposed to feel amazing. Now, just to put a, a, an, a, an element of realism, because, of course, when, when people find that right, when people find out my doctor of happiness, that title doesn't even sit right with me. I am, but even I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, that sounds so cheesy. Doctor of happiness. I always think it's better than the alternative with Dr. Feel Good, because that's creepy. So I'm kind of stick with Dr. Happy. But when people find out you've got a PhD in happiness, it's, oh, I bet you're always happy, aren't you? <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm not. Nobody's happy all the time. I'm happy most of the time, but nobody's happy all of the time. Um, and 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 people say to me, have I got to fake it? I'm going, no, no, you've not. Have I got to pretend to be having a good day when I'm not? No, you've not. Have I got to put a cheesy smile on my face? No, you've not. Have I got to do jazz out? NHS Scotland is not ready for jazz hands. All right. You coming in on Monday going, woo, don't those weekends drag? Isn't it great to be back at work, everybody? You're going to get bullied for that. All right. That is too happy. Um, there's an old English word, grinagog. It's a 16th century word. It's a beautiful word. We don't use it anymore. But a grinagog is somebody who's so happy you want to punch them on the nose. So I'm not asking you to be that happy. That's ridiculous. That's scary. And if we go back to the diagram that I just showed you, back to the PowerPoint, give me one sec, is I think that's quite a sobering picture. If you track this person over a week and you look at their personal brilliance or their well-being over a week, then what you'll find is they're all over the place. And you say, well, that's not a two percenter because they're all up and down. But actually it is a two percenter over six months. So this person has had a really positive six months. But that week was particularly challenging. That Wednesday, I don't know what happened on Wednesday, but Wednesday beat them up. And what I want you to understand is that that's OK. All right? It's perfectly OK to not be OK. Everybody, even two percenters, will have weeks like that where you're all over the place. And what, what pains me, actually, I'm going to come to full face to tell you this, right? Because I'm, I'm seeing teenagers who say, I've had a bad week, so I must be depressed. I've got depression. And I'm like, no, you've just had a bad week. <laughs> You really don't need medication because you've had a bad week. So, folks, it is a bit of an issue here is that we're talking ourselves into th being medicated for a non-medical problem. I mean, a week like that, right, it's perfectly normal. Everybody has them. There's a technical term for it. It's called being human. But that said, what positive psychology will do is help you bounce back from those difficult times. So let's have a look at a couple of top tips and i wasn't sure where to take you with it really i'm going to go with this one because it's good fun and i think what we need is a little bit of fun in our in our lives this is jessica right she's only thankfully she's only on for 40 seconds whack your volume up there's a big top tip coming but jessica's going to show you how look i can be a shark now my whole house is great I can do anything good. I like my school. I like anything. I like my dad. I like my cousins. I like my aunts. I like my Allisons. I like my mom. I like my sisters. I like my dad. I like my hair. I like my hair. I like my haircuts. I like my pajamas. I like my stuff. I like my rooms. I like my whole house. My whole house is great. I can do anything good. 
better than anyone. Better than anyone. Okay, team. Look, I'm hoping that you got the sound on that, and if that comes comes through properly, honestly, now I'm not asking you to do that. Yeah, thanks, Nicola. Nicola got yeah. I'm not asking you to do that because you're going to scare people, all right? But the reason I love that video is that pretty much everybody on this call, like literally all of you, I've got too many things to do and not enough hours to do the things that you need to do. So we've all got a to-do list that's longer than both arms, right? That's too many patients, too many emails, too many bits of paper, too many customers, too too many meetings to attend, too many webinars to attend, right? So we've all struggling with what I call busyness. B U S Y N E W S. That means you've all got a to do list that's longer than both arms. And pretty much in the NHS, every single week of your working life, you're going to have too many things to do and not enough time to do them. All right. I'm, and I understand that and I'm sympathetic to that. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Jessica and positive psychology, which is over this side, which is something I think is about a thousand times more important than your to do list. And it's what I call your to be list. Now, this is a really big deal, right? Because your to be list, requires a degree of um, a degree of honesty and courage, actually, to dare to point the finger back at yourself and say, OK, honestly, and I mean honestly, who am I being while I'm doing those things on my list? Right. So I'm a being world class. I'm a being full of energy, passion, confidence, positivity, optimism, hope, gratitude, compassion. Or am I accidentally being ground down by working in the NHS and there'd be nowhere to park? Because really where I'm coming from is here. If we can get this bit right, which is like kind of literally stepping into that being your best self, then it's a bit spooky what happens. If we get this bit right, then loads more stuff gets ticked off your to-do list because <laughs> you're super productive when you're being your best self. And right now, <sighs> oh my gosh, right. Now, I'm not saying don't do a to-do list. I write a to-do list. I write one every day and it keeps me organised. But my to-be list is like rocket fuel for my motivation. My to be list is, and I used to do them, I don't do them anymore unless I'm having a really bad day. I will literally get a post it note and take two minutes out of my day and write my to be list. I used to do it on a Sunday night before I started work on Monday. What version of me am I committing to being this week? And if I write a to be list, the same things are on it every single time. Number one, every time I'm going to be a nice human being. Number one, because if I can't manage that, I shouldn't even leave the house. I'm going to be. Uh, positive. I'm going to be confident. I'm going to be grateful. I'm going to be loving. I'm going to be kinder than I have to be. And the truth is, folks, you can be whatever. Right? You can be. You can be angry. You're being. You're right to be angry. If you're not getting the pay rise and you're being restructured and you're being worked to death, right? You can be angry and you can be disgruntled. But you've only got four thousand weeks. It, it kind of. It seems like a bit of a waste. There are better emotions to have. So. Being that best version of you works really well as a team thing, by the way. Right. Get a team to be list who we and then stick it on the wall. And that just reminds everybody. Right. So you to be list. It's alongside your to do list. And I'll leave you with. Can I just leave you with? Because I know my time is nearly up. And we want to have a Q&A in a minute. But I want to leave you this because it's work and it's at home. And it's the smallest thing that I've changed because you need a takeaway. Right. So as well as doing your to be list and being a two percenter, your takeaway is this. The four minute rule. The four minute rule is a beautiful thing because it's a, a very small change that has a very big impact. Um, and the four minute rule basically says that you've not got to be your best self all day. You've only got to be your best self for four minutes. <laughs> so, ooh, that sounds doable. So if you could just be your best self, so not jazz hands, not happy clappy, not stupid about it, but just a very confident, positive, upbeat, optimistic human being just for four minutes then other people will catch it off you and you will create, you will have that flourishing effect on people and you'll create a 2% environment. When you create that, things will kick off here differently. Solutions will pop up here, right? So therefore, the first four minutes of any interaction become really important. So the first four minutes of your next meeting, the first four minutes of going back to your ward, the first four minutes of a shift changeover, the first four minutes of going home to your family, the first four minutes of coming into, into work in the morning, the first four minutes of a meeting, if you can just nail being your best self for four minutes, then what you'll find is quite miraculous. Other people will raise their game and loads more stuff will get done up here. Right. So I'll give you I'll give you a home example, not a work example, because work's obvious. Let me give you a home example. I'll give you the old and the new version of me. So the old version of me. Um, so let's say I'm working in Glasgow and I'm commuting back down. I live in Derby. So that's what, four hours, four and a half hours, Friday night. 
five and a half hours. So I'm leaving Glasgow, dr driving home, two little kids, right? Wife and two little kids. I'd fall through the door at eight o'clock on a Friday night, absolutely exhausted, bursting for a wee, key in the door, fall through the door. My little kids, it's eight o'clock, they're nearly going to bed, they've got the jammers on, but dad's home. So all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, dad's home. So they're running down the hallway at me and they jump at me. I like little primates. I've got one clinging on the leg here, one clinging on my leg. They're climbing up, we're going, dad, dad, let me tell you about school. And I'd be, no, let me tell you about the M6. Yeah, what a nightmare, what a nightmare journey I've had, right? Sat and I've said four and a half. Guess what? Five and a half hours on a Friday. Disaster, junction 18, there's a massive tailback. Thinking back now, folks, day after day after day, I'm going home being the most average dad in the world. And then I started to consider the four minute rule. And the four minute rule changes everything because it changes the question in here. The question becomes, how would the best dad in the world go through that door? Right, and the, and the answer to that is like obvious, like, like he really wants to. But I wasn't doing it like that. So I thought, OK, my gosh. Instead of going home being toxic. I'm going to go home and do the four minute rule. So I used to. So I changed everything. So I thought, OK, right. I get through the door. My kids don't even know what the M6 is. They're only tiny. So why am I even telling them that? So I got through the door and if they don't run at me, I'm going to seek them out and be all over them like a rash. So we're having a right good time. And, and instead of saying, how was school? Boring. What did you learn? Can't remember. I've been asking that for years and getting nowhere. I changed the question. My four minute rule question became, how was school today? Was it good, fantastic or brilliant? Right. And they're only little. So they were like, yeah, it was really good. Actually, Dad, I'll upgrade it. It was brilliant. And off they go. And they start telling me about ancient Egypt and the dinosaurs and all the good stuff they've done. Right. So I've come out. They're now here. Kids are here. Families here. Families in that. So everything becomes easier because I've asked a great question. They've got the highlight is mealtime's easier. Homework's easier. Bath time's easier, bedtime's easier because I've come home and created a great atmosphere instead of what I used to do was come home and brag about how bad my day had been. Picking out the low light of my day to share with the people I love the most. Now, I know that sounds obvious, but changing you, changing you, you going through the door and giving your family your best self. And you've only got to do it for four, four minutes. I mean, my kids are now, my kids are big now, to be fair. They're like, Sophie's 28. She's like, Dad, is me four minutes up yet? Other dads don't do this, right? You might think, oh, I'm just, is Andy just trying to be funny? Because I'm not, no. I would say that the four-minute rule has fundamentally changed my life, right? And I didn't just do it once. I've done it for years, going out and being the best version of me for the people I love the most. Of course, it works in meetings. Of course, it works coming into work in the morning. But going home is super powerful. So I'll come full circle because we're going to do Q&A in a minute. Can I just leave you with this? Because it does bring me back full circle to where we started 50 minutes ago. There's something in emotional intelligence called emotional soup. So I've, I've written lots of books, right? I mean, I think you'll get some titles circulated to you at the end. But how do I explain this? It's quite a simple concept. Emotional soup basically says that in any social situation, so whether it's a webinar today, all right, or whether it's, in your next team meeting or whether it's on your wards or whether it's home with your family where people are thrown together then everybody is having a say in the flavor of the soup so if you like we're all having an input into whether this webinar works or not because because of the chat and the banter right you're all be having an input into the in the emotional flavor of your next team meeting you will be having an input into the emotional tone and flavor of your family this evening so there's a big question that comes out of that it's a question that I can ask, but I can't answer it because only you know the answer. But of course, the question is, what flavours am I adding? <laughs> All right. So am I, am I adding positivity and love and kindness and gratitude? Or am I accidentally adding being a bit stressed out about working in the health service and wanting one of those hybrid jobs? Um, so the truth is, folks, you can add whatever you like. I can't command it. Nobody can command you to do this. But I'm beginning to like, demand it of yourself. I just while I've been talking, I've scrolled back to the top of the chat. So 50 minutes ago in the chat, you put in there some words that describe you at your best. All right. And I knew when you were writing them in that they wouldn't be words. I knew they were going to be ingredients. So I'm just going to, these are yours, not mine, right? So this is what you wrote, bubbly, loving, enthusiastic, confident, uh, creative, bouncing, laughing, happy, fun, warm, uh, resilient, innovative, creative, silly, cheery, caring, productive, enthusiastic, chatty. Look, folks, you can put anything in your soup, can't you? But they were the ingredients that's you at your best. We are capable of doing that. And it doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. It matters what you're doing. 
you're the ones on this webinar today and you can't change anybody else but you can change yourself and you can upgrade and put great ingredients in so the whole of my bit of the webinar and i think that what i was hearing before me actually was the same i've tried to craft it around those two words there all right i i think that you you most people vastly underestimate the impact they have on the people around them right you matter you matter to you matter to your work colleagues you matter to your patients you matter to your the communities you serve you matter to your families and what i just wanted to remind you is that you need to matter to you all right so you're so busy looking after everybody else that sometimes you're taking your eye off yourself <laughs> all right so you need to matter to you so folks the four minute rule your to be list that's hopefully got you just started with a couple of things you can go away and do um i thought we'd stop for a chat i can give you some homework if you want it i've got a pretty cool thing you can take away but um, i think the four minute rule is the smallest thing that i've changed so the biggest impact on my life and it works at work and it works at home which is why i wanted to share it with you um so it's always difficult to know what to put into a webinar anyway i'm going to shush that it's a bit under miles an hour because i'm excited so i will shush has anybody got any questions um obviously easy questions would be nice but i'll, I'll take anything pretty much um i did say to the to the to the, the team behind what if they ask me a question i don't know i'll just say i don't know all right so does anyone any want to know anything because it's been a bit of a 100 miles an hour tour through my research there so i'm going to shush zip it so, what's coming through yeah, um, thank you andy I, I, I don't even know where to be to begin i am absolutely fantastic we've had what an amazing 45 minutes and as we were listening to you, the things that struck me is this aligns so perfectly with the work and how we deliver this work. So you talked about an aim. So being the best person that you can be. You talked about actually having a method of doing that, the four minute rule. You talked about tracking that over time and it'll be different. So we talk about data over time. You had a run chart about being the best that you that you could be and how that's different every day. Creating the culture, the two percenter culture. That is how we are trying to support teams on that daily basis. And that um, what we might learn from the people who are not ill, what we're all here today to do, to learn from each other. So uh, absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for that session. I'll hand over to Claire, who's been, what a job keeping an eye on the chat box, but um, I'll hand over to Claire for any questions that we've got. Yeah, thanks. Just echo what Joe said, Andy. Uh, yeah, not easy chat box to follow because it's so active today. But I, I wanted just to start with a comment rather than a question from Fiona and Fife, who says she's been a nurse for 45 years and this will be the first day of the remainder of the rest of her life. Thank you so much. So I think that, 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 could sums up. that could be the T-shirt winner right there. You know what I mean? That could be the T-shirt <laughs> winner. Could. Yeah. I think yeah. it kids. Um, so just to pick out a couple of things, um, there's a, a bit of a theme asking people saying if you're going home to an empty house yourself, how do you do your four minutes to yourself <laughs> when you're not going in to somebody? Yeah. That's the first question. Um, well, I think that's the four minute rule is definitely to do with people. So it doesn't have to be going home necessarily wherever there's people. All right. It works pretty much everywhere, except not on the London Underground. If you go to London, it doesn't work on the tube because you being a little bit uh, making eye contact and saying hi to people isn't going to work. But I'm just talking about whether I mean, if you're going home to nobody, then, you know, hopefully that, that you, there will be somebody eventually to go home to. But I think it's coming to work, bringing it into work or bringing it into you, into your friendship groups, whatever. All I'm saying is being your best self when there's people around you. Other people will have almost no the th human beings are wired to catch emotions. Now, the issue is the negative emotions also spread like wildfire. Right. So if you come in grumpy and negative and grumbling about your commute or about oh, being overworked, then it only takes one. And, and then you've created that negative impact. So the and, and four minutes of that, <laughs> then that kicks off and it spreads across a whole department is like everybody has a bad day. So what I'm asking you to do, whether it's home, whether it's work, wherever it is, is not do what everybody else is doing. I was thinking about being a two percenter is like looking around at the communities, not doing not doing what everybody else is doing, not joining in with those negative conversations. So that's really what I'm talking about. I mean, yeah, it's, it's hard if, you, if you've got nobody to go home to. That's probably more difficult. But bring it to work. 
bring it to yeah. work for sure. Bring it to work. That's good. I've got another one from Laura in Highland. It says, do you have any top tips on moving people from the bottom percent to the top percent in the workplace? Yeah, yeah. I think we need, we need more time to do that. I'd love to get people in a room together, actually, and do this properly. But um, I, I don't think today's been about that. I mean, there are things that you can do to, you, you, as I said earlier, you can't make anybody else do this, but you have to lead by example. It's the only thing you can do is be your best self and other people will catch that. All right. But the easiest, the easiest thing is, is for you to lower your tone and become like them. That's the easiest thing. So it's hard. You know, why are there so many mood movers? Because it's easy. It is easy to slip into mediocrity. It is easy to look around at what everybody else does and do that as a human being. So we are built to fit in. So we're gregarious. We're pack animals. 10,000 years ago, a lone human being on the African savannah was a dead human being. You couldn't survive on your own. So we've got this inbuilt sense of for our physical and emotional security to fit in. We have to fit in. And therefore, if everybody else is grumbling about being in the NHS and being overworked, it feels like the most natural thing in the world is to fit in with that by joining in with that. So really what I'm saying is the best way to elevate other people is not to join in with that. It is to consistently be changing, the to, 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 to be your best self and without being over the top with it, because it is a, quite a fine line. But you can't make anybody else. You can't change anybody else. I tried. You can't. But you can influence them. <laughs> and that starts with you. This this webinar today has been about what the 130 people on this call can do differently. And that starts a revolution, little mini revolutions across NHS Scotland. Um, and that's our revolution start, by the way. Okay. So <laughs> final thing, and there's, there's been over 200 people on the call, so uh, you've, you've started a revolution here, um, is uh, just a big thank you from everybody. And the final comment from Julie and Ayrshire Narn is, can we prescribe you on the NHS? Oh, bless. Yeah, well, the thing is, you should, like I say, we'd love to get, yeah, I'll talk to you separately because I, I think you there's certain things we could do to easily create some quick wins here. Honestly, it's such an obvious message. And people don't want to come to work to be, down and, and upset and grumbly they really don't they want to come to work and shine and yet sometimes the nhs stops us doing that so it's about actually working with a bunch of people within nhs scotland that become the champions of this and spread it out and things can change quite quickly i think thank you so much andy and i think you're, you've really just bottled that message that we try and encapsulate within the essentials of safe care because that is about how do we create the conditions to help people and um, be able to deliver that that care as safely as possible and the, being the best that they can be um, will absolutely help us as doing that so thank you so much it's been absolutely fantastic I know that people have been asking in the chat about resources and we will share all of um, Andy's publications um, and his books and the, the links to them um, with the, the summary of today's webinar and the recording of today's webinar so you'll be able to collect them uh, connect to them there and I'm sure Andy you're going to see a a big spike in sales <laughs> <laughs> over the next couple of days. It certainly has um, generated a huge amount of interest and energy, and that's exactly we, what we want it to do. To everybody on the call today, um, we're really keen, as always, to continue to learn about what we can do differently to improve it, what you've found um, helpful for um, from today, what are the things that we, um, we need to change. So QR code there, just if you click onto that, you'll be taken straight to an evaluation form of which um, we really greatly appreciate your feedback. And lastly, a bit of a plug for our um, national event. So more of the same. Um, coming in the 20th of September. So this will be um, an all-day in-person event at the Golden Jubilee um, in Glasgow with the, the morning session focused on the essentials of safe care and our afternoon sessions um, being in relation to each of the SPSP improvement programmes. So watch out for details for that coming um, later in the summer. I would just like to take an opportunity to say a huge thank you to Nicola, Shauna and Andy, but also to all of you on the call today for your fantastic engagement. Um, it's always tricky when you're doing these things online and particularly when we've got the cameras off and um, the, the microphones muted, but by goodness me, you have been absolutely fantastic. 
And a huge thank you from myself to the team. Um, these things do not happen um, overnight. There's a lot of planning and organisation that goes into it. So a huge thank you to the, the team for delivering a, a brilliant session this afternoon. Um, look forward to seeing you all very soon. And thanks again for your time this afternoon.